Hello, son and daughter. Welcome to Old Texas Scare Podcast. This past summer, my girlfriend and I threw, hiked the Colorado Trail. One morning, we're breaking down our camp, and the sun had just come up, so it was still pretty early in the morning, maybe around 6, 6, 30 a.m. We were camped in this long, straight valley in the Lost Creek Wilderness for any fellow CT through hikers. As we're packing up and getting ready to start hiking again, we can hear this crazy screaming sound over and over again for maybe a couple minutes. It sounded pretty far off, but was echoing through the valley. We both sat there and listened to it, trying to figure out what it was. I have spent a lot of time in the Colorado mountains and have never heard this sound before. At first, we thought it may have been a person, but we were at a fairly remote section of the trail. Once we finished, we did some research, and we think it may have been a mountain lion, as they sometimes will make a similar screaming noise. But who knows? We were both a little nervous to start hiking again after that. I've been in the military since I was 18. I'm now 60, 7 years old. In my younger days, I was blessed to have been from a family of hunters and outdoorsmen, so I've always been around guns, dogs, and hunting. In the early 1960s, when I was still a kid, we lived outside a small town on a large farm. This had been in our family for over 100 years. It was 1968. We were working on our dogs. We would take about 15 or so of them out on a run for breeding purposes. There was myself and another fella who'd been together for about five years or more. We knew each other real well. The way I figure it, the only reason the dogs saw what they did is that we were upwind of whatever it was, and the dogs somehow smelled it and went and stood their ground looking, standing their ground, until this thing came upon us. It must have been about 5.30 in the evening, I reckon. The sun was going down, but we had plenty enough light to see what we were doing. We'd run these critters pretty hard. We were out in the country, where there was nobody around for miles except an occasional farmer. We didn't see anybody else that day. It started raining about noon and continued to rain into the afternoon. A real cold, windy December type of day. Not until about 5.30 or 6 when it quit raining. We were getting ready to turn the dogs back in when we started hearing them bark and growl. They took off out into the woods. They went in a big circle, came running back in our direction, which was now upwind of whatever it was. To scare them, they ran right by us and headed home to the fields. I've never seen them run the way they did that day. They were scared and running for all they were worth. We both got a good look at the thing when it stepped out of the woods, not more than 30 to 40 feet away from us. At first, we saw just its head sticking above the grass in a small clearing. We watched it for a minute or so, and then all of a sudden it rose up from where it was standing and began running on two legs. It ran right into the field about 50 feet from us. It had black fur that was very coarse-looking, even for this time of year. It was kind of like fur on a bear, but it stood up on two legs just like you and I do. The face was very wide, with eyes that were kind of glowing and pulsating white. It had very long arms, not quite as long as an ape's, but they hung right by its chest, and the hands only had three fingers, no thumbs that I could see. The fingers resembled more like claws. We were both looking at this thing with our mouths hanging open. It took off running headed right for the edge of a big ten-foot deep cut bank along the road. When it got to that cut bank, it never hesitated once. It ran right off the side of that bluff about six feet or so, then just disappeared. The head and eyes were what we saw first. We knew we were looking at something real, but the rest of the body took some time to develop. It was down in the low spot when it stood up and started running. That's when we realized exactly what it was. There wasn't any doubt in our minds. Although I don't know what it was, whether it was an ape or something. I've heard stories about werewolves before, but that thing wasn't a wolf. 
It didn't walk like one, nor did it look like one to me, either. Whatever that was scared the heck out of us. It didn't even make a sound, never growled or spoke or said one word. It didn't even appear to try and want to harm us. It just ran off. Like I said, right up the side of that bank, maybe 15 feet high, without so much as looking back once at us. The only reason I'm telling you the story is that whatever it was came right back down off that bluff and got one of them hounds. The rest of them hounds caught up with it about two miles. We didn't find the dog until the next day, about ten miles south of where we stood and watched it run off. It was a good hunting dog, one of the best I'd ever had. And here is where an exceptionally cold winter night of negative 25 degrees below zero may be worse than that. The weather had broken, and we were hunting raccoons in the woods when we ventured onto some open ground and ran into whatever it was that had the hound. The dog was dragging itself, its back broken in three places, and didn't have a mark on it except where its back was broke. The tracks left by whatever got him were unlike anything I've ever seen before. They weren't human tracks. They were too big for that, but they weren't no animal tracks either. They were bigger. That's about all I can tell you. I don't know what it was. We saw that day. But whatever it was really scared us and ran off with the fine hound dog. Something I've never seen before or since. I just wanted to tell you all that before something bad happened to you out there in the woods. I know most of what I've seen over the years has been pretty real, but with some of them, when the weather's bad or when it's dark outside, I can't say for sure, really, that they're there unless I see them again. We went backpacking in the eastern Sierra a couple of years ago, a heavy traffic trail where hikers take horses in as we were approaching Seven Pimmies, where we were going to sleep for the night we passed a couple that said, watch out for the horse. We went a few minutes ahead, and on the trail there was a dead pack horse. Sun was pretty set at this point, and we had about a mile or two to go before we were going to stop. This massive horse lying across the trail was kind of disturbing and sad. As we set up camp two miles down the valley, all I could think about was some scavenger feeding on that horse that night. Never got the story and what happened as we came out a few miles ahead of where we went in. Trailhead was Little Lakes Valley Trailhead, outside Tom's place in the Easter Sierra. went backpacking or fishing overnight with a female friend. We're both fairly experienced backpackers, and it was a spot we'd been to many times before on the Salmon River in upstate New York. We also brought our collie along with us. We parked in the same spot we always did at the end of a dirt road and hiked in about 45 minutes to our favorite fishing spot. Had a great day knocking back beer, swimming and pretending to fish. We put out the fire and went to bed around midnight. We were awakened about 3 a.m. by the creepiest noise I've ever heard in my life. It honestly sounded like a demon, groaning and growling away, maybe five feet back from the edge of our sight in some thick brush. Her usually fearless dog was cowering in the corner of our tent. I was kind of spooked but I calmed myself down, ran through the local wildlife in my head, and decided it was probably a bobcat. For anyone who doesn't know, bobcats aren't very dangerous, but they can make some supremely freaking noises. Their territorial growls often sound like human screams or crying babies. I grabbed my mess kit, the BSA style one where one half is a frying pan and the other is a bowl, and it outside to try to scare it off. I repeatedly bash the two halves together as loudly as I can to frighten it, which has always worked in the past. I've even run off black bears a few times with this method. The thing did not move. If anything, it got closer. I try not to attribute human emotions to wild animals, but the growling sounded angrier, 
At this point, my friend and the dog are out of the tent, and Mr. Fearless is trying, with all his might, to drag her back down the trail toward the road. I shine my light into the dark, and it reflects off of a pair of eyes that I swear looked human, peering out from a bush at about my chest height. Maybe it was crouching. Maybe it was standing on something, but it damn sure wasn't a bobcat. I'm not proud of this, but we fled in disarray, slept in the car in a McDonald's parking lot, and went back to get our stuff in daylight. Nothing was taken, but the site was tossed, even the tent interior. The one sensible thing I had managed to do during our retreat was rezip the tent, but it was open, not clawed open, unzipped. Still have no idea what the hell that thing was. Haven't camped there since. Added bonus. My high school had a pretty huge wooded area behind it that my fellow social outcasts and I used to play manhunt in after class. One day we came across a homeless guy who had died in his sleeping bag. Fortunately, he had passed pretty recently, so nothing too big had gotten to him yet, but still pretty gross. I went up Echo Mountain with a girl I was dating once. It's a reasonably tough climb, but at the top there are the ruins of this old hotel complex that burned down several times about a century ago. Old narrow gauge railway stuff, etc. Anyway, we get to the top and we're sitting on what's left of this concrete staircase, looking out over the city, and I hear a rustling in the bushes somewhere behind us. I turn around and it stops, so I shine my light on it. It's some guy, in a weird hunched over pose, looking at me. Maybe 150, 200 feet away. He just freezes in the beam of light for a second, then quietly sidesteps back behind a bush and disappears. I called out after him, but he must have gone back into his underground lair. Anyway, we decided we should head back down the mountain immediately. Still not sure if drugs are serial killer, but... Hey, we survived. Girl refused to go up Echo Mountain again, though. I suppose due to the nature of this page, a lot of you have heard of a not deer. For those of you who haven't, I pray you never find out firsthand. Oh, where are my manners? My name is Madison. I'm almost 20 five years old, and I've lived in a tiny village called Ullen, pronounced Dusling, for about two years now. Shortly after moving here, I encountered one of these creatures said to only roam the Appalachian states. I know. It was after dark, and you're going to ask if I'd been drinking or anything, or you're going to say that my eyes were playing tricks on me with a deer in some shadows. First of all, I was stone-cold sober that night, as I don't drink, save for once every other blue moon. Secondly, this. This thing was standing directly under a streetlight. I can't be losing my mind, right? Right. Pardon me, I'm getting ahead of myself. Allow me to start from the top. It was a stagnant, humid August evening in tiny Podunk Ullen, not Ewan. The sun had recently set, and the stars had just started to wink to life in the gradient canvas of navy blue, purple, and black overhead, so I'd probably set it at about nine, nine, fifteen in the evening. Things were fairly quiet, as they usually are in this little town. A dog barking in the distance and the occasional whisper of a car going down the main road about a block and, uh, fair from my house. I live with my wonderful fiancé. We'll call him Kevin, as I'm not sure he'd want his identity known, and his name isn't really relevant to the occurrence. Directly across the street from a lovely small baseball park, I used to love going for evening walks through this little park until that night. I finished letting our two dogs outside for a run and potty before their bedtime and fed our deaf cat, Lance. Then I grabbed up my double-decker, cheeseburger, shaped coffee, mug-slash-pipe, baggie of weed. Yes, I do smoke pot regularly, but don't jump to any conclusions yet. In Lucky Bick Lighter, which is red with a picture of Morty Smith from Rick and Morty printed on it, 
and after telling my fur kids that I loved them and would return shortly, stepped out into the soupy night air. It was so warm I half considered staying inside where it was more comfortable, but I'd had a long day at work at the local dollar store and definitely needed to get some mano a mano with a cool grass in my favorite smoking piece. Maybe that'd be mano a mano a mano. I don't know anyway, where was I? Oh, yes, I was crossing the street to hop over the ditch and onto the side of the park when I heard the strangest, most terrifying sound, something straight out of a nightmare. The best way I could describe it would be like the cry of some kind of animal giving birth, but the sound was so wet and gargled as though the laboring beast's throat were slit. I was mid-jump when this horrendous nightmare fueling whale, and it scared me so badly that I'd tried to stop in mid-air, succeeded only to fall into the ditch, probably three or four feet deep, not including the extra eight ten inches of height I had had over said ditch. Pain exploded up my leg, blooming from my ankle in a sensation I know all too well as a sprain, me being a klutz and all. I let out a cry of my own, grabbing my already swelling ankle and rushing to tighten my high-top shoe with a stick pushed down on either side as a makeshift splint until I could hobble back across the street. After making the impromptu support for my injured foot, I finally looked around for the source of what had given me such a fright. That's when I saw it, standing directly under a streetlight alongside a paved road leading through the park, ears perked and gaze trained directly on me. The creature was bigger than any deer I'd ever seen, even dwarfing me in its horrible stature. I'm no small woman by any means, standing at six feet tall and about 270, 300 pounds. But this, I don't know, animal. It had to be all of my height just at the shoulder, and the rack atop his head was a sight to behold in and of itself, or probably would have been had it not been so badly battered, and in some parts completely snapped off at the end. At one point I would have wagered that the beast was at least twenty-four, twenty-six points. He would have smashed the record for trophy buck, which is currently twenty-two points. For those who are curious, the moment I could tear my gaze away from the monstrous, darkly stained antlers crowning the beast is the moment I really noticed that something was terribly, terribly wrong with the creature. Its fur was filthy and matted with what I can only hope wasn't the same deep crimson stuff staining its antlers, but due to how some patches of its body gleamed as though encrusted with liquefied rubies under the overhead light, my hopes are probably in vain. Yes, several chunks of its skin were completely gone, exposed flesh wriggling with plump white little bodies that would occasionally fall away onto the paved road below. This creature was beyond sickly. He looked all but zombified. His skin barely hung on his bones, and his legs were just bent all wrong. This could have been a malformed deer that had just been abandoned young. Got it gotten deathly ill, but I can't express enough to you all the sheer size of this thing. The bottom of its chin would easily come over the top of a brand new big pickup truck, like a dually or something. It couldn't be any smaller than a fully grown moose, I swear to you. Despite its horribly emaciated and even rotted state, it was massive and it was beyond imposing. But the most horrifying part of all about this creature is the eyes or eye. One had obviously been gouged out at some point, replaced by a puckered, inflamed mass of blood, pus, and more maggots, but the other one held enough malice. Pure, unmistakable disgust and outrage at my very existence, for the both of them. I was completely frozen for what felt like just a moment, terrified beyond screaming at the sight of an almost skinless deer skull, snarling with rage at me atop such a grotesquely huge body. The lack of visible muscle framing the creature gave me no illusions to the level of its strength. Somehow I just know that if the thing wants me dead, I'll be dead. But finally the creature gave me what I can only call a nod of its disgusting antlered head then turned away and sauntered off towards the neighboring strip of woods. 
I swear it felt like I was only there for about a minute or two, but when I could finally move, blink breathe, the eastern skies were starting to lighten. I had several missed calls and voicemails from a worried future fiancé and numerous texts as well, all wondering where I was and why I hadn't come to bed. I rushed back home across the street and wrapped up my ankle to stave off the swelling, topped off with the occasional ice pack, but I couldn't sleep for days after what I'd seen, felt, and experienced. I was getting paranoid, jumpy, and my partner, godsend that he is, started to worry. I finally tried to tell him about what happened and what I'd experienced, but predictably he thought I'd just been tripping balls. However, notice that I hadn't even reached the park before this happened. I never got to light up. I was not under any influence when I'd seen the beast, not even when I'd lost almost eight hours of time. Why am I telling you all this now, after almost two years of silence? Well... The past three nights, I've been hearing wet, guttural snorts and these terrible snapping scrape sounds out by the tree in the front yard. And the heavy hoof sounds that precede and succeed those noises are more befitting those of a horse or maybe a moose rather than any deer. I'm beginning to wonder if the beast from across the street hadn't changed his mind about letting me survive witnessing his terrible majesty. I remember that night in the desolate heart of Iraq like it was yesterday. My name is Captain Daniel Raptor Mitchell, and I was part of a Navy SEAL team sent on a top-secret mission to capture Saddam Hussein. The planning and execution of this operation were unlike any other I'd ever experienced. Little did I know that it would be a mission that would forever haunt my dreams. Our team consisted of the best. Of the best seasoned warriors with nerves of steel, and a commitment to duty that ran deeper than the desert sands. The geopolitical stakes were astronomical. The world watched as our team of elite soldiers geared up for what would become the most crucial operation of our careers. Under the cover of night, we descended on Sodom's compound with the precision of a surgeon's scalpel. Our intelligence was impeccable, and we knew every inch of the target. The operation was swift, like a deadly dance, choreographed to perfection. We secured Saddam without a hitch. It was a moment of triumph, of victory for justice. But the darkness that enveloped Saddam's lair held secrets darker than the dictator's own deeds. As we combed through the labyrinthine compound, we stumbled upon a chamber concealed in the bowels of the building. The air was thick with an otherworldly aura that sent shivers down our spines. The room was dimly lit, and the first thing that caught our attention was an eerie, pale hand. It looked human, light, but something was grotesquely wrong with it. Large, deadly claws protruded from its fingertips, and its skin was like nothing I'd ever seen. Shiny and glass, like seemingly covered in a clear, viscous liquid. Then we saw the face. A large, terrifying face with milky white skin and eyes that gleamed with malevolence. The bluest veins ran beneath those eyes, pulsating ominously. The only thing moving was its tongue, long and serpent, like slithering out of its gaping maw. The creature's most unsettling feature, however, were its antlers, black as the deepest abyss. They resembled mold, infested wood, twisting and curling from its skull like the devil's own crown. This massive, deer-like humanoid stood before us, looming at a staggering seven to eight feet tall. It was unlike anything any of us had ever seen, a grotesque fusion of man and beast, a living nightmare. Fear gripped us as we instinctively opened fire on the abomination. Bullets struck its glistening skin but it hardly flinched. The creature let out a bone-chilling scream that echoed through the compound, causing our hearts to race. Suddenly, men in dark suits and sunglasses stormed into the chamber. They identified themselves as Secret Service, and their orders were clear. The United States government needed this creature alive. They said it was for analysis to understand what it was and where it came from. Reluctantly, we ceased our attack. We couldn't believe it. 
Here we were, battle-hardened seals, facing an unholy terror, and yet our own government wanted it for study. The Secret Service agents expertly subdued the creature and began preparations for its extraction. As we left the compound, Saddam Hussein and Toe and that horrifying creature now captive, I couldn't help but wonder about the geopolitical implications of our find. What secrets did this creature hold? How would it affect the world order? Only time would tell. Operation Desert Enigma was a success in capturing Saddam Hussein. But it left us with questions that haunted our dreams for years to come. The creature with the glass-like skin and the sinister antlers would forever remain an enigma, lurking in the shadows of our collective memory. About a year ago, I went camping with some friends. There were about six of us, and we went for a walk around sunset. I walked ahead of the group about five to ten minutes and then stopped in a clearing on a hill to wait for them to catch up. I was looking around at the sun going through the trees when I saw something staring at me, peeking its head out from a tree. It had red or yellow eyes and its head looked like a log or stump. It stared at me and I stared back at it for about thirty seconds before realizing I could see it ducking back out of view. My friends arrived at about the same time as I did, and when I looked at them and turned back, it was walking away. It was tall and thin, with skin that looked like bark and long arms, with hands that resembled sticks. It walked into the darkness. When I told them what I saw, they told me it was an owl and made fun of me for being scared of a bird. I haven't gone into the woods since. Should I be scared? It's been haunting me since, and I want to know what I saw. I don't know if this is the right place to ask for help, but I would appreciate it. When I was around 14 or 15, me and my friends were playing airsoft deep in the Alabama woods, having a good time. Later on, one of our friends, we can call him H, shot my brother with a bad gun that he wasn't supposed to have, and it definitely hurt him a butt. I in anger started running at him, shooting my airsoft gun, and he bolted off. He was a very large guy and a bit older than us, and he was in a white shirt. That part is important. We continued to play about 30 minutes or so, and he never came back. So we started calling him and looking for him when we saw what we assumed was him, with about 30 or so yards in the distance. Just a big white object. When we called him, or what we assumed was him, it or he bolted the opposite way. We decided to go back to the house to get my friend's dad to come make him quit running. When we got back to the house, he was already there and had been for nearly an hour. We were all so confused as to what we saw in the woods that day. A few years later, we learned about the Alabama white thing and found it to be a huge coincidence. But I always wonder what, if to this day. Hi, I'm a first-time Reddit user, but I've been doing a ton of research after the encounter I had today that I just can't explain. Also, I'm extremely sorry for everything being all over the place. I'm still trying to process everything that has happened. Myself and a few friends are staying in a cabin in northwestern Pennsylvania for the weekend. The cabin we are at is on a gravel road, but surrounded by 30 acres of untouched woods. Today, after eating an early dinner, around 4, 5 p.m., we decided to explore the woods a bit. As we were leaving the driveway, I had an extremely uneasy feeling and the forest sounds grew extremely quiet, but then quickly got louder, so I ignored the feeling. As we stepped into the woods, we came across some very strange animal tracks. We are no strangers to animal tracks or the woods, so this was very out of the ordinary. Some of the tracks looked similar to a mountain lion, but were sunken into the dirt as if it weighed in the 600, 700 pound range. Then there were some smaller tracks that looked closely to possibly a small dog, but there was just something off about them. They were too close together to be a normal dog's strides. 
As we continued through the forest, we started to hear some strange, but not too out of the ordinary sounds. As we passed a bend in the trail, we all heard a bigger branch or twig snap, and my friend spotted something that looked extremely similar to a mountain lion, but the coloration was off. As soon as he spotted it, it disappeared from his line of sight, so we immediately turned around and hurriedly walked back to our cabin. As we started to head back, I started to feel a very sinister energy and started to almost hyperventilate. My chest was very tight, and I could barely breathe, which is very out of the ordinary for me. As we got into the cabin, I started to feel as if I'm specifically being targeted or hunted, and couldn't take my eyes off of this one patch of forest. My friends were all feeling the same energy as me, but not as intensely. We realized that the energy seemed to be circling us outside of the cabin, and when we looked outside of one of the bedroom windows, we saw a glimpse of the being far in the woods. During this whole encounter, I was struggling to breathe and was having bad chest pains that I couldn't explain. After about two hours of seemingly endless torture from whatever it was, the energy seemed to dissipate and leave the surrounding area. It definitely didn't feel like a mountain lion energy, wise, and even the appearance of it seemed off. We didn't hear it make any noise other than the twigs, branches snapping. It was more of feeling the energy it was putting off. The whole experience didn't feel real, and I still can't make much sense of it. I can say for damn sure it wasn't like any living creature I've ever encountered. Does anyone have any ideas of what it could be? Anything at all would help. I was camping at Hart Mountain Hot Springs. At 6.45 a.m. I was leaving my campsite by foot to use the nearest bathroom. The campsite sits above the field overlooking the road that runs west to other campsites, a field creek and the three hot springs pools. As I was walking out of my sight, I looked across the field and saw an animal. It was at least 200 feet away. I thought it was a wild horse, but there are no wild horses in the Hart Mountain National Antelope Refuge. This animal's body was facing me, south, with its head turned slightly to its left. I thought it was a horse because it had a black mane of hair and its body was brown and shiny. It appeared to be about the size of a yearling at first. I say at first because later I saw a human man in the same location. There's a path there from the west campsites that travels to the parking lot by the east campsites, and I now believe the creature was seven feet to eight feet tall. It turned its head right directly toward me, then it turned its body leftward east, and walked across the parking lot toward the bridge across the creek, and I lost sight of it in the trees. It was bipedal. It did not move quickly walking with its back slightly forward and arms swinging at its sides. I later looked for footprints. The ground was too hardened to find any. I crossed the bridge and walked a little up the creek north, looking for any evidence like hair and could not locate anything. What do you think? My only thoughts are either a person dressed in some kind of ceremonial gear or animal skins, although the height makes that unlikely or an animal with chronic wasting disease, which also seems unlikely given that it was bipedal. My story happened many years ago in Oregon. So, my buddies and I went fishing at Crane Prairie Reservoir. On the way home, after a weekend of camping and fishing, we're driving home down Highway 58 near Eugene. We're following behind our buddies in their Toyota pickup. We end up getting stuck behind a slower semi-truck. They're up ahead of the semi and my buddy and I were hoping to pass so we could catch up. I was riding shotgun just enjoying the ride. I'm looking at all the beautiful scenery, the trees, rivers, and mountains. Well, I started to notice how the semi-truck would pass a patch of small trees and the wind off of his trailer would practically blow the branches down to the side. As we entered long sweeping left turn, the truck passed a small tree that was on the right side of the road, a small maple or something with big leaves. 
As the truck passed, I was waiting to see how hard the wind would blow the tree sideways. Well, as the truck went by the tree blow sideways in there, squatting behind the tree is a big foot. It's exposed and startled. It stands and turns 180 degrees and runs down into the forest. There are drainage systems along the road and it's running along it. I could only see it from the waist up. I could clearly make out his huge arms, giant thick chest, and its big head that was sort of pointy on top. It was covered in grayish hair and big. I could make out its facial features. It ran straight up and down like a sprinter with its arms pumping. It moved to a speed no man could ever reach. I've hunted and fished for many years, and I could say without a doubt it could outrun any big game animal. It ran out of sight into the thick forest. I yelled out to my friend, did you to see that? But he didn't because he was driving and looking for a place to pass. We finally passed the truck, and at the next pullout, our buddies were parked and waiting for us. We pulled in, and I flung open the door and tell my story. I was all lamped up with adrenaline. My buddy then tells us a story about his uncle in a Bigfoot encounter. He says he believes me and wishes he could have seen it. It's something that I can't explain. But it's something I experienced firsthand. I've always believed, but after that day, I know. I live in East Central Louisiana in Washington Parish. For the past few months, I have been seeing a number of lights moving above my house. At first, I thought the lights were drones. I noticed after watching them, night after night, they didn't move like drones. I've ever flown. I got binoculars and a spotting scope and noticed a central white RGB type light in a V-patterned small craft. I considered it to most likely be an alien drone, or possibly a military drone. Possible, since I'm so close to an airport. Well, I decided one night to go outside and signal the small crafts with a flashlight. I've heard math is the universal language. So I flashed a couple sequences of prime numbers. I told my wife to come outside quick. I could see a large ship approaching from a few houses down nearly grazing the treetops turning and redirecting itself towards my backyard like it already knew my GPS location. I looked in amazement followed by shock and fear. It passed slowly like it was looking for a place to land. The backyard is too small and too many trees around. But it passed so close I could have thrown a baseball and hit it. It slowly passed my yard and went over the neighbor's yard and I couldn't see it anymore after. I looked up and saw about ten same types of ships flying fast high in the sky, in a sequence. Then I noticed smoke everywhere, like my neighbor's house was burning down, smelled like gunpowder. I looked for the source of the smoke. I believe the ship popped off smoke before it was going to try and land one street over. I realized I would have had a heart attack if it had landed. To describe them, large square bronze looking metal. White lights around the sides. Circle pattern, red flashing lights on the bottom. My wife says she had a hard time with a glare of white lights and couldn't give a definite description. The next afternoon, we were all outside and hundreds of them were in the sky. I could hear the neighbor's kids making jokes about an invasion. I saw people looking up and down the street. I called my mom and told her. She said I need help. I started to film one as it got dark. My wife and I are sitting in chairs in the middle of our lawn. One is flying over and I'm recording. The next morning before work, I decided to watch the video. As usual, when I record a UFO, the video isn't what was thought to be recorded. To sum it up, I recorded a UFO landing a few feet from me and a little alien next to it. Looking right at me. Now the repercussions of this lasted three or four days. Dark entities manifested in a bunch of my photos on my phone, my wife's phone, even pictures in other unrelated clouds. Needless to say, I had to delete a lot of pictures. Alien photo editors, please explain the physics behind that one. We were visiting friends in Maine, and they lived not far from the Appalachian Trail and a group of colonial-era cellar holes. 
Being a history buff, we packed lunches and headed up to the cellar holes with a metal detector. It wasn't entirely legal, but it's not like the cops were hiding behind trees. We found some cool pewter buttons, square nails, interesting shards of fine pottery, and unidentifiable chunks of iron. After enjoying our lunch, we wandered around, and then someone suggested that we climb a nearby hill to watch the sunset, which was a glorious sight. We, a group of friends reminiscing about our college days, were laughing and passing around a bottle of wine. As the purple shadows crept up the hill, only the very top where we were seated still had some light. Suddenly we realized that we would be descending into darkness, so we gathered everything up. Luckily, my friend had one of those headband flashlights. A bit dorky, but it came in handy. He took the lead as we made our way down with plenty of wine fuel slips and laughs. We descended into a dense cover of pines, and there were two huge boulders marking each side of the trail, each the size of a full-size car standing upright. My wife suddenly giggled and said, Carl, disapprovingly. I asked, what? And she claimed, you grabbed my ass, and you know you did. I denied it, and instead held her close, awkwardly half running as I pushed past my friend and his wife. They were bewildered by the situation, but caught our fear and hurried after us. About twenty yards down the trail, my friend turned his flashlight back up the trail, revealing some red cloth along the edge of one of the big rocks. Resembling the edge of a shirt, my friend yelled something, and the tiny sliver of cloth disappeared around the rock. We stood there, breathing heavily, watching the circle of light panning back and forth on the rock. We stood there for what felt like a long time not seeing or hearing anything. Tom said he'd keep the light on whatever it was, and I should guide the women back down the hill. We did so, and I kept looking back toward Tom, who remained still and silent. Finally, as we emerged from the trees and entered a field, he came running down the path, his flashlight bobbing all over the place. He reported that he never saw anything, but had heard a metal scraping sound before he started running. Lived in Yellowstone for a summer. Took a nice hike X-15, 18 miles. Got back to car, 5% cell battery left. Car battery was totally dead. Sun is set and getting darker by the minute, around 9, 30 p.m. No cell service at the car in the trailhead parking area. So exhausted, hiked the half mile back down the dirt access road to the paved road. Walked to the top of the closest hill. Another half mile. Flitter one single bar. Call. Get park service. Call drops. Happens twice more. Two percent. Finally get through and talk to dispatch. She sends the wrecker my way, but that the wrecker was in West Yellowstone at the time doing another call. Will get to me in perhaps one hour. Says the ranger ought to be by in a bit to secure the parking area for the night. Thank her and hike back down the paved road, then turn and hike past the hills and draws and curves down the dirt road to the campground. Get to car. Very last bit of light, fading into very dark night. Clear but low, no moon. Then Yellowstone, so pretty dark. I settle in for the wait. A few minutes pass, and I figure I'd better let the wrecker know which car in the lot was mine for whenever they got there so they'd know which car needed help. There were about 15 or so in the lot, but no one was coming, going from them, just cars of folks who were out in the back country for another day. Totally dark after a few more minutes. See a set of headlights round the curve into the lot. Figure it's the ranger. Tell him howdy. Explain the situation to him. He radios and confirms. Debbie a dispatch that the wrecker is coming. They affirm about another hour or so. He lets me know he has other areas to secure, but we'll return in a couple hours to make sure I got out of there, okay? I thank him and he drives off. About another half hour goes by. I'm sitting in the driver's seat, hood up, but can still see the entryway to the lot. I hear the gravel crunching and see lights approaching of another vehicle. Weird, 
No one should be arriving yet, and it's not as though anyone is coming to the area to night hike. It's Yellowstone. That's dangerous. I'm sure folks do it, but the truck comes into view. It is driving basically without pressure on the gas, just rolling forward. About three miles per hour, slower than is courteous, creepy slow. It makes the loop around the lot, and as it pulls in its lights cast over my car, hood up, there was no way that the truck didn't see me, notice my hood. The lights finish the sweep of the lot, and the truck crawls over to the far side of the row of cars I've parked in. The truck backs into the spot. I expect the lights to go off and begin to dread the inevitable interaction, whatever it might be. I remember a friend of mine had told me, if ever in a bad spot, be assertive. Because I'm normally pretty much a people-pleaser helper, I emotionally strap in and prepare myself. The truck lights never shut off, and suddenly the truck roars forward about 15 feet out into the gravel, then slowly creeps back into the space. Weird. The truck begins to repeat this. I'm on edge. It's really noisy, and there is no reason to do that at all. I begin to check my mirrors, unsure if the truck is trying to distract me while someone else approaches. It's so dark out, it's very hard for my eyes to adjust from looking at the truck with its lights on to the mirrors. The truck continues this erratic revving and backing for ten or so minutes. Finally, the lights shut off and the engine turns off. Here we go. A man slowly approaches along the front of the row of cars. My eyes are still darting to each mirror, checking, checking. He is about twenty or so feet in front of the line of vehicles, walking towards the display map and trailhead marker to my left. My cell phone has totally died. His walk is a very slow stroll. As he draws near and finally is in front of me, I'm assertive. My heart is pounding, but I press myself and commit. I swing my door open and greet him with howdy. Have you got a jump? He pauses. What? His voice is strangely high and blushy. Almost like, like Mickey or something. Just oddly high. His stature is six, perhaps 220. Mid-aged, I can make out the silhouette of jeans, cowboy hat, plaid collar shirt. Normal attire for that area, but anyone from that area definitely knows that pulling into odd trayhead parking areas in Yellowstone at 10 p.m. is just something that no one does. So extra weird. I feel like he is familiar enough with the local culture to know that he shouldn't be there. I repeat exactly what I said, a bit more directly in tone, and add jumper cables. Have you got any? My battery's dead. He doesn't answer my question, but instead he asks, after a long pause, Do you have help coming? I panic inside. I'm panicking inside. My heart is pounding. I deliberately inflect a happy casualness into my tone and reply, Oh yeah, actually you just missed the ranger on his way out. Lie. It had been 30 minutes and the wrecker is due here any minute, but I'm trying to avoid the $200. Lie, wrecker's still another half hour away at least. The guy paused for a moment and said he didn't have any jumpers. He continued to walk then, along the front line of cars to my left, arriving at the trailhead and map, perhaps 25, to my left. I can still barely see him, mostly just able to see the movement of his silhouette. He stands there in the dark at the map for perhaps five minutes, which is lunacy because he has no light with him, and it is way too dark to see a damn thing except outlines of mountains and stars. There's literally nothing to see at the map, nothing. He just stands there. I just stand there by my car, watching him. I'm standing behind my front driver door, still occasionally glancing around for anyone else behind me, after a few long minutes, he turns back and strolls towards me again in front of the cars. He draws closer to me in my car and says, You sure you have help coming? If I grit and throw my voice out at him, Yeah, they should be here any minute. He turns square to me and takes a step or two slowly towards me, closing the distance from about 20 feet to 10 in front of me. He again asks if I'm sure. As he steps towards me, I hear be assertive, 
in my head from my friend and I step from behind my door and transfer my bear spray canister with a glow-in-the-dark safety dangling off of it, visible, aimed at him in my left hand, and don't reveal my right hand, letting him consider. I'm sure, I say. The next words are just in the bottom of my throat and are just a hair away and I ready myself to say the words take one more step towards me and he'll spray your ass. But he stops and looks at me, and I stay very quiet and still, staring at him. He stays in his stance, facing me. It's very quiet. Moments pass. He just says, okay, and turns and slowly strolls back towards his truck. He turns his truck on, and his truck repeats the series of odd revving and pulling out and slowly crawling back in. About ten more minutes... Then finally he slowly crawls out of the lot, gravel popping around the draws, fading into the blackness. I still am not convinced that I'm alone, and I still am afraid that someone else was with him. I am also terrified that he will ditch his truck beyond the curves and then make his way back on foot. I grab my day pack and steady my nerves and make a mad dash away from my car, locking it and dashing across the lot to a long horse trailer hiding behind it waiting 15 minutes or so. Yellowstone is not the best place to just chill outside, though. It gets cold. Moreover, there are, there are things that might eat you if you accidentally spook them or because you're meaty and it's nighttime. Fifteen more minutes pass and lights become visible down the parking lot road. My heart is still racing and goes into overdrive. It's the wrecker. Relief floods me, and I begin to shake and almost cry. I explain how glad I am to see the wrecker to wrecker guy. He just thinks I'm a dumb girl afraid of the dark and swipes my card and jumps my car. I drive back to the cabin for an hour and a half. I'm exhausted and sleep. I was driving home from work on a misty night in October of 2019. I had just crossed the border from Pennsylvania into Maryland on Route 15 South. I was between Emmitsburg and Thurmont and listening to music on the radio, trying to stay awake and alert. As I approached Little Owens Creek, I saw something move in the corner of my eye. I slowed down and looked to my right toward the creek and trees. What I saw next took my breath away. I slammed on brakes. There was a large creature standing on two legs by the side of the road, clear as day. It looked like a hybrid of a wolf and a man with dark fur and a long snout, pointed ears, and bright yellow eyes. It had muscular arms, legs, and long claws on its hands. I couldn't see the feet. It was six, seven feet tall, and it had a long tail that was wagging slowly. The upright creature stared at me as I skidded to a halt. It then let out a loud and terrifying howl that reverberated throughout my car and body. The sound was more stark than any horror film howl. It created a surge of fear and panic in me. The beast took a step toward me and then another. The expression on its face was that of anger. I didn't know what to do. I was practically paralyzed by fear, and I could only watch as the creature moved a few steps closer. At that moment, bright lights from a vehicle behind flashed behind me, and then the sound of a horn blared. The driver slowly drove by me on the left. The creature also noticed the light and the horn. It turned its head to look at the other vehicle. I quickly stepped on the accelerator, and I sped forward. I didn't stop for anything until I got home in Frederick. When I walked in the house, my wife could see that I was upset. I told her what I witnessed. She begged me not to tell anyone. I didn't have my cell in the car, by the way, but I doubt that I would have called the police. It's been almost four years since my encounter. I have continuously looked for references to a similar creature. The road to my objective wound, parallel to a dike, its path meandering close to the serene waters of the Muir's River. On the opposite side of the road stretched out a smooth, undisturbed plain. It was a tranquil setting, a far cry from the bustling town I had left behind, 
As I walked, I couldn't help but appreciate the beauty of nature around me, and little did I know that this serene journey would soon take a bewildering turn. About one kilometer away from the last houses of the town, the road came to an abrupt end at a bend in the embankment. It was there, at that unexpected terminus, that my encounter with the inexplicable began. I clambered up the embankment, and as I reached its edge, my gaze was drawn to a most peculiar sight. Approximately seven meters away from where I stood, arranged in a semicircle, were about five dogs. They stood still, oddly silent, their attention fully riveted on something in front of them. And there, in the center of their attention, stood an entity that defied all comprehension. The being before me was unlike anything I had ever encountered or even imagined. It stood at least one meter tall, its head elongated to an eerie extreme, devoid of any discernible features such as eyes, nose, or mouth. Its torso was disproportionately long compared to its limbs, which were no more than 25 centimeters in length and similar in both diameter and proportion. The upper limbs appeared smooth, devoid any discernible joints or growths. There were no telltale signs of gender, no elements to identify it as male or female. The most astonishing aspect, however, was the being's skin or covering a pitch black substance that seemed entirely alien to the natural world. This strange entity had me utterly captivated, but it also filled me with a sense of unease and uncertainty, as if reacting to my presence. The dogs abruptly broke their silence and started to run back towards the town, vanishing into the distance. Simultaneously, the enigmatic being began to move, retreating towards the Mura's River. Its movement was nothing short of remarkable, an astonishing blend of swift steps and kangaroo-like jumps. Remarkably, during its retreat, not a single sound emanated from the being except for the occasional crunch of ice, giving way beneath its weight. The footprints left behind were far from human. They were flattened circles, unlike anything I had ever seen before. The river lay before me, its flow reduced to a mere trickle at that time, with a riverbed reaching depths of two meters. This terrain prevented me from pursuing the strange entity any further. For a few moments I stood there, both fascinated and bewildered, my senses overwhelmed by what I had just witnessed. It took me a minute or two to gather my wits, and driven by curiosity and a strange compulsion, I decided to follow the trail left by the mysterious being. For the next two hours, I combed the grove along the river bank, but despite my best efforts, I could find no trace of it. I was certain that it, it had not entered the water, for the wide beach bore no marks, and the unfrozen snow remained undisturbed, its surface as smooth as untouched sand. It was during this search that I noticed a curious transformation in the environment. The place where the strange being had stood emitted an intense, pungent smell of chlorine. However, upon returning to the spot after two hours, this scent had metamorphosed into a powerful odor of ozone, tingling my senses. My encounter with this enigmatic being haunted my thoughts for a long time. I grappled with its existence and the conditions under which our paths had crossed. I was a rational person one who did not believe in ghosts, devils, extraterrestrial beings, angels, or any such entities. Yet that day, amid the clarity of the weather and the untamed wilderness surrounding me, I had experienced something that defied all logical explanation, a memory etched into my mind, impossible to forget. In the summer of 2011, my 12-year-old twin sons were having a friend sleepover. We live in a three-story house, and all three of the boys were in the basement area playing. I was on the second floor, sitting on my couch, reading a book. It was early evening around dusk. All was peaceful other than the ruckus the boys were making downstairs. I was sitting there half, reading my book when the boys all came running loudly up the stairs. The stairwell door was on a sliding mechanism, and when they got to the top, 
instead of sliding it, they sort of pushed on it, and it came off the track. With it off the track, it could swing back and forth. I told them I would fix the door later. Anyway, they left the door off the track, and all three went running up to their third floor bedroom to play. I was still on the couch when only a few seconds after all three had just gone upstairs. I saw my son come around the corner, lift his arm, push the now swinging stairwell door open, and move down the steps. He never lifted his head to look at me. His head was down the entire time, and he never said why he was going back down there. My first thought was that he looked a bit odd and moved kind of strangely. Then I thought, why didn't he say anything? Then I figured he left something down there. This all took a matter of maybe two, three seconds, when suddenly I heard his voice laughing and talking loudly upstairs. I freaked out. I jumped off the couch, ran over to the stairwell, looked down, and called his name, but he didn't answer. I swear to God, this is a real story, and every hair on my body was standing up, and I had chills. I have them now just writing about it. So I ran upstairs and saw him sitting on the floor with his brother and their friend playing. Even though I knew it was completely impossible for him to be downstairs and upstairs at the same time, I asked him if he had somehow just gone into the basement. He, of course, said no. I swept the basement looking for a person. I checked doors and windows and closets. Even though I knew that whatever that thing was, it looked exactly like my 12-year-old son. It was as solid as a real person and was wearing exactly the same clothes my son had on. It was the same size as him and was able to push a solid door open and everything, only it moved a bit weird and never looked at me or spoke to me. Nothing else happened that night, and I never could explain it or understand it until three years later, almost to the very day that the incident happened. My son was diagnosed with leukemia. He's undergone years of terrible cancer and chemotherapy and has battled it like a warrior. He is 19 now and his treatment has now ended. He is doing great and is in remission. Praise be to the Lord. I've heard that doppelgangers portend bad luck or illness, but I never thought that when I saw that thing that looked at my son, it meant something bad would happen to him. But the day he was diagnosed, I realized why I saw what I saw. I don't know for sure if it was some sort of warning or not, because it scared the hell out of me, and it felt very sinister. I pray I never, ever see it again. So my wish to report this anonymously, I work as a cop in the Washington, D.C. area and am intrigued by wife and kids were playing in the neighborhood playground at approximately 2019 yours when my 10-year-old observed four stars. My wife looked up and said they were moving. I looked up to see the stars for myself and saw six, ten of these glowing balls of light flying in a straight line heading northeast from the High Bluff Valley area of Virginia, right off US-1. I managed to catch the tail end of the formation on video, but lost focus while attempting to zoom in. One of the lights veered away northbound near the end of the formation. I moved to higher ground to see if I could catch the rest of the flight path, but they disappeared. My wife, kids, and multiple witnesses in the playground saw the lights, I'm guessing drones, but I'm not sure. I guess we saw UFOs. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.